right, we're going to get started for today. So hi, everyone. Welcome to today's discovery session. Uh, thank you for joining us before heading into the long weekend. Uh, I hope everyone has some exciting plans. Uh, before we get started, I'll quickly go over today's uh, webinar format for um, everyone. Our guest speaker today is Daryl Boyce from um, ASHRAE. Uh, and a reminder to everyone during the discussion period, there will be two ways to ask questions. The first is to raise your hand and I will unmute you so that you can talk. And the second is to type your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen and then I'll ask your question for you. Uh, please note that there, if you'd like to comment on someone else's question versus ask your own question, please feel free for you to do so. This is meant to be a conversation. Um, that's why it's called community discussion. Uh, the only rule is the same one that we have for all of our presenters is no sales pitches, please. So let's get started. It's my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Ashray's current president and fellow Canadian, Daryl Boyce, who will share how they're uh, applying sustainable development principles in the real world as they retrofit a building originally built in 1978 for their new headquarters. Thanks, Daryl, and let's, um, let's get started. Uh, a little bit about ASHRAE, uh, if people that don't know, it's a professional organization supporting engineers, contractors, technical society. We have, uh, well, up until this year, this year has been a bit of a challenge, 57,000 members in 132 countries. Our global headquarters is located in Atlanta. We write standards, guidelines, educational programs, and, uh, uh, and we're quite a diverse organization. So the existing headquarters building in Atlanta is uh, at 1791 Tully Circle. Uh, this building is about a 35,000 square foot building. Uh, it was renovated actually in, uh, we opened it in 2008, since 2010, uh, Lee Platinum. And uh, the thing that we did with the building at that time, we had a, an ad hoc committee of members that oversaw the renovation and expansion of that building. Uh, but we designed around some uh, some equipment donations that were done early on. And so we had two different systems in the building, which we thought was a good way to demonstrate uh, a couple of different technologies. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, the problems with that later. Our location was in a site where the Children's Hospital of Atlanta was expanding a very large uh, hospital uh, campus. And uh, so we ended up selling our, our building and property to that hospital. And we found a, a replacement building in Technology Parkway. So it's a technology area in Atlanta. The original building was 35,000 square feet. The, the building that we purchased was 66,000, which offered some opportunities in terms of on-site storage. Built in the 70s, 1978 has been mentioned. And we purchased that in 2018. Now, one of the reasons when we were looking at a new headquarters building, we looked at uh, leasing space, having a building built, buying property and building a building. But we realized that uh, the bulk of the buildings that will be around in 2050 are here today. And uh, we need to really uh, look at how we take an older building and make it great and to serve uh, occupants and meet some uh, sustainability uh, challenges that, uh, that face us today. So that's why we, we purchased a, an older building and decided to renovate it. One of the first things we did is uh, looked at our project requirements and uh, mission critical workforce safety. Uh, it had to be affordable and constructed within the available funding that we had. Needed to exceed ASHRAE's applicable standard requirements in areas that were important to the indoor environmental quality. And the acoustics needed to exceed acoustical levels for office environments. That seemed to be one of the major complaints about our existing building was the acoustical uh, um, sort of people disturbing other people with their, with their talking in the open office environment and net zero energy ready in terms of uh, demonstrating uh, sustainable principles. And some specific uh, OPR requirements were um, ASHRAE standard 189.1 exceed the requirements of our green construction standard Demand side energy, uh, we wanted it to be at or less than 21.4. We hope to get to 15 kilobtus per square foot per year. 
Uh, water efficiency design, uh, we need to find a way to limit day daytime flood loads, as I said, acoustics. And we also wanted to be able to deliver outside air at a value of about 1.3 times the minimum requirements of standard 62.1 and use demand control ventilation for high occupancy areas. And daylighting was another area that, uh, uh, that was important to us. And the other thing we wanted to be able to do was really understand uh, the energy use. And, and so we had mandatory uh, metering requirements, HVAC, lighting, plug load, whole building energy. And, and photovoltaics once it was incorporated into the project, domestic hot water. And uh, we were to the extent that uh, we were utilizing uh, other metering like domestic water use, cooling power, irrigation, and domestic water, water usage, uh, we were looking to have that as well. One of the things we did look on uh, at very early in the project was what certification programs were we going to uh, utilize in evaluating our building. We looked at LEED, Green Globes, Well Building, Fit Well, and Living Building Challenge, uh, and landed on absolutely we were going to use our own Ashley Building EQ program to evaluate uh, how the building was operating. Uh, but we found that uh, the value of the other programs and the cost to actually have them certified outweighed their value, and we invested the money in, in the building instead. Um, ASHRAE standards, so that we're going to meet or exceed uh, all the regular standards, 55, 29.1, etc. Now there's a real uh, interesting challenge in getting this done because we had a, a, a hard move out date from the hospital. And so uh, we needed to be in the building by 2020 October. And so uh, the design team started in 2019. We actually construction uh, really got underway uh, in uh, January, the, the opening sort of, uh, sort of the initial real kickoff of construction was in early January. And we need to be uh, finished in uh, mid to late uh, August, sort of substantial completion, and then fully occupied by the end of October. So how do we achieve our project goal? Well, we set a construction budget of 8.5 million and the project schedule and the project requirements as we discussed. And we went about uh, hiring a team through a, uh, um, a request for proposals uh, situation. Now, I show you the site plan here and it's kind of interesting because if, if I showed you the site the overview of our existing location, our existing headquarters buildings up against a major highway in Atlanta, I-75, and this new site is, uh, has a lake on one side, a small lake and lots of parking and lots of uh, nature, natural areas around it. So much better atmosphere. We looked at our programming. So we made sure that uh, we had sufficient space for all our staff, which meant that we're looking for uh, 44,000 gross square feet. Uh, so with our 66,000, we felt very comfortable about the building. Now, when we purchased the building, there was, it, it was, uh, had a, actually not been occupied for a couple of years and we evaluated on the terms of it had great bones and basically the structure was sound, but there was a lot of work that needed to be done. And uh, there's some site plan in some areas of the building. And this gives you a sense of the, of the bones, the structure. And, and as I said, it was in great condition and the services and the systems within it were the pieces of the puzzle that needed to be replaced. We also did an evaluation of our existing wall panels and uh, found that they were, were not very efficient in terms of, uh, of uh, resistance to thermal bridging. And also we looked at the existing glazing. And when we purchased the building, it was fundamentally floor to ceiling glazing. And uh, that was, not also, was also not very effective. So this gives you a sense of its location and, and uh, proximity to sort of that natural environment. Uh, a much, much better uh, uh, situation. One of the first things we did was look at the key climate design drivers, you know, the summer conditions, winter conditions, the swing and the groundwater temperatures uh, to establish uh, our base requirements for the design and energy utilization of the building. We also did an evaluation of incident solar radiation for the winter 
and also for the summer. So we understood that impact on the building uh, as we uh, went forward with the design. The other thing that we did is uh, we looked at photovoltaics. So our design was net zero ready, which meant that the energy consumption was at a low enough value that a reasonable amount of photovoltaics could get us to net zero. And so we looked at the roof area about how we could get uh, energy out of photovoltaics on the roof. Um, further evaluation of the structure indicated we could not put the photovoltaics on the roof. So, so we've sort of dropped that uh, analysis and we're, we're right now out for a proposal for, uh, for uh, photovoltaics to be put elsewhere on the site. Um, psychometric chart analysis was done and, and uh, we looked at uh, the hours of the operation that would be within the comfort range with normal outdoor air um, temperature supply and, and we analyzed that. Uh, we looked at our tree cover and shading that would come from that. And we really had a regenerative design process, you know, the concept design, we had metrics and charrettes and we, went to schematic design, refined the design, went into design development and finally ended up with construction documents. With a construction design that we believe is right size and it, it's going to meet our needs well into the future. Path to net zero, and I'm not gonna talk about all this on here, but it's key is the area that talks about uh, the recommendations. So wall assembly, we we're looking at R17 minimum Roof assembly R35, uh, window assembly U.4, and uh, window to wall ratio target of 40%. External shading, um, sort of having one inch external shading in key areas, <clears throat> and an infiltration level of 0 0.0112 CFM per square foot. These were some key parameters for us in terms of getting our energy use down. We also did a, a skanky chart uh, uh, look at the energy utilization, uh, just so we could understand where, where our energy was being used in the building. And we looked at the existing envelope, ASHER 9.1 HVAC, and uh, found that it would take us a uh, high performance HVAC uh, system to get us to our target of 21.4 BTU per hour, BTU per square foot per year. And uh, so this is the parameters. Window to wall ratios, I talked about 40% was where we were heading and uh, air infiltration and insulation were also important. So we did a sensitivity analysis of the, uh, of the envelope uh, to make sure that we we're in the right ranges. So the wall, the roof, the infiltration, window U value, shading depth and window wall ratio. And that's how we ended up with the R17, R35. Uh, etc. And uh, we went on to a further energy analysis and ended up with a high performance envelope, airtight construction, external shades, and daylighting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about daylighting in a minute. So the minimal intervention, we looked at the uh, window. So taking out those floor to ceiling windows and, and getting us back to um, um, an average of 40% glazing. Uh, we looked at uh, if we didn't uh, change the existing panels, uh, whether or not we would uh, do well. We also looked at option B, which is uh, modified intervention, which is uh, raising uh, the window requirements by cutting some of the panel area out. And uh, also with high performance envelope, cut panels as needed. So this is uh, insulated metal panels that we were considering at one time. We also did an analysis of all assembly R values for the various options and ended up with the uh, schematic uh, design of the perimeter as shown in this uh, diagram uh, with the windows and the shading in the, in the critical areas uh, around the window settings. And this is how it's integrated into schematic design. And if you noticed at the beginning, we had a barrel roof over the uh, center area and this was replaced with a flat roof, uh, which uh, really helps us in terms of uh, um, solar gains and, and allows us to keep that area much cooler and, and use less energy. 
And um, so the, the real office, open office relationship to light was something that was really important to us, natural light uh, penetration into the workspaces. And so we did an analysis. There's really two levels of the building. The top level, we have the ability to add skylights. The lower level, uh, the largest component of the middle level is uh, a training center, which is not, daylighting is not necessarily a good thing when you're doing uh, presentations and, and uh, things like that. And so it was much less staff occupied in that uh, mid floor level. And so, uh, there was less issues with that. So existing ribbon windows give you quite a bit of daylight, almost excessive daylight. 40% uh, window relationship on the north and south, 30% on east and west with existing uh, headers and existing windows size with a 40% uh, redu reduction in the windows. Gives you a pretty good daylight area. We also looked at uh, taller windows new sills and monitors, um, limited skylights. And actually this is uh, really where we ended up existing window heights and the limited skylights, which are 18. And we feel that uh, it gave us uh, very good daylighting at the uh, top floor and reasonably good daylighting on the smaller area of the building on the mid floor. And the largest area of the building again was the training center. That gives you an idea of all the analysis we did. So here's where we are with windows on the east west at 33.5 percent and north south 41. And uh, the lobby section was also designed. And this is uh, this gives you a sense of the skylights and uh, no skylights. And here's our Short windows, 18 skylights, giving you a sense of the, the natural lighting that's going to be impacting the upper end of a little building. So adding the skylights doubles the day, daylit floor area and the raised windows would have been good, but uh, from a financial point of view, we had to uh, value engineer them out of it. And interior desk layout is tall, big desk partitions running parallel to the facade to allow to maintain uh, inside lighting levels. So path to net zero update, annual site energy use. Um, so we're right now at uh, slightly above um, the uh, target 20 or 21.8 or 21.4 target. Uh, but we're actually doing uh, the blower test analysis of the building sort of now that's been fully enclosed. And we believe that's going to get us back to the 21.4 kilobtus per square foot per year that where our target was for net zero. So HVAC concept overview with the process we demanded more from the building envelope, as I just said, we demanded more from the building occupants in terms of plug loads and, and daylighting. We utilize high efficiency systems to reduce energy, hydronic versus air side with DOAS and the right size of the equipment based on the demands and provide the sex flexible systems to provide great indoor environments. Resulting needs, hydronic system reduces energy, radiant system, smaller modular control, control valves and ceiling fans versus VAV units and ductwork, simultaneous heating and cooling, heat pump and or heat recovery machines. So we have a heat, pump, heat recovery chiller we decouple the temperature from humidity through the DOAS and we recover energy wherever possible. So we have an outdoor air cooled module heat pump stage pumping, air cooled DOAS decoupled from water side system. And uh, we have overhead radiant panels for heating and cooling in exterior zones, cooling only in interior zones and ceiling fans to induce cooling and improve environmental comfort. So this gives you a sense of the radiant panel methodology and uh, their overhead radiant systems. And they're uh, actually radiant panel clouds and they're open to the structure, provide access for other trades. Rigid piping in exposed areas, panel support system is required and duct dist distribution is only for ventilation quantities, about 0.15 CFM per square foot air distribution constant volume and uh, 
in the open air, we're using a fabric uh, style of ductwork, uh, reducing diffuser count and duct branches, and ceiling fans throughout to improve um, comfort levels. And here's a sense of the ceiling panels that, uh, with the upper pipe to graphite and the insulation. And before the fan install, uh, the indoor air temperature at 72 degrees, we get about 82% comfort level. After the ceiling fans installed, we could feel we can run the temperature up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit and get 89% comfort level. Overhead radiant systems were part of the area reason why we can get down in our in our energy utilization. And uh, all air. We looked at an all air system and and we felt that we could get a 16.7 out of it, uh, but with the DOAS and the water system, we could get it down to 15.6. As it turns out, there were some other areas that we had to cut spending on. So rooftop package, similarly zoned air handling DOAS units, entropy heat recovery, uh, overhead mixed air and mixed mode ventilation. And we have the ability to do night flush air site economizing. And so in this one here, you can see that we have uh, uh, some air coming in. That's with the all air system. But we went with the HVAC option two hydronic system. Uh, so it's uh, with enthalpy heat recovery, uh, desiccant heat wheel, uh, cold water thermal unit options, radiant ceiling panels, sensible fan, thermal units in higher occupancy areas, air cooled heat pump, water cooled heat pump is an option but we, uh, we didn't go for that. And we also evaluated ground source energy, uh, but the number of wells uh, put our costs uh, above our, our budget. So this semifinal design was actually, uh, the only thing that's really changed on this is the size of the deck. And here we had to pull it back because of uh, code requirements and the roof uh, was dropped down to the level of the ceiling of the other roof. Gives you a sense of the quality of the interior environment with uh, with uh, skylights over the uh, common area, the uh, atrium, and uh, be much uh, a much better workspace for our, our staff. And this is a staff uh, room. This is a, a, a typical uh, meeting room. So we learned a few lessons. First of all, you've got to understand the construction market where you're building. Um, we found that uh, although radiant systems are quite cost effective normally in the Atlanta area, it, uh, it was quite expensive to install the radiant system because of the fact that it had to be pipe fitters uh, by, by their uh, union requirements. Uh, so the plumbing system replacement came along and gave us a few surprises, electrical system replacement and fire protection system and the envelope improvement to uh, to uh, meet the EU eyes. So here we are, this was the team that put it all together and uh, I'm now ready to uh, answer any questions you might have. Thanks so much, Daryl. Uh, I know I love seeing the photos of the, um, the building. It's so nice to have this such natural light. It makes a huge difference for sure. Uh, uh, just a reminder to everyone, uh, there's two ways to ask questions. One is you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Or the second way is you can type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and I'll ask your, your question for you. Um, the first one is from uh, Vitaly. So is, uh, Daryl, is, is any methodology to verify later during operation design target EUI and if any financial penalty is planned, if target consumption will not be achieved. Yes, we are going to evaluate the, uh, the actual operation of the building and, and uh, all that data actually will be online on our website for everybody to see. Uh, what we're going to be doing with this building is using it as a case study to demonstrate um, how you take an older building built in 1978 or in the 70s or thereabouts converted to a great uh, office space to serve uh, our, our occupants, which are staff and our volunteers that visit the site and other people that go there for training, uh, give them a great indoor environment while 
minimizing the use or, or the waste of energy while we're doing it. So yes, we're going to continue to monitor it. And uh, we have a, a number of uh, systems that we're looking at that will continue to evaluate the operation. We're looking at some uh, analytics and fault detection. We, of course, have the regular building automation system to report on, uh, on how the building is being operated and energy consumption. Uh, we'll have dashboards and uh, we're going to continue to evaluate the building based on our building uh, EQ program, which is sort of a continuous monitoring program to, to evaluate our, our ongoing operations. Perfect. Thanks, Daryl. A few more questions here. Um, Danver, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. So it says, hi, Daryl, you mentioned achieving 11 uh, lead water category rating. Uh, did you consider using gray water? Uh, we did. Um, it it um, wasn't really an option on this site. Uh, we did consider it. Uh, there wasn't many rocks that we didn't turn over in our, in our analysis. Uh, and so our target was to meet those uh, requirements, but not necessarily, again, sort of have it certified to, uh, to lead. So we did look at it, and given the, the existing systems, again, it, it's all part of, of, of uh, designing a renovation of an older building within a budget that's, that's reasonable, and, and so it just got, got outside our ability to, uh, to implement very well. That's true. They say anything's possible with unlimited uh, time and money. <laughs> uh, I have a question here from Robert Greenwald. He says, can you share your approach to net zero? You showed 21 KBTU slash SF. Um, will the PV under consideration take you to zero? Yes, yeah, so actually we have an RFP that's uh, it's right out in the street now for uh, third party um, organizations to uh, come in and, and pro uh, provide the photovoltaics on our site that would take us to zero. Um, so we're not, we're not really sure what the cost will be for that, uh, but we felt that the, the right way to do it was to get it out to the, to the photovoltaics market and, and have them figure out how, that, how we can do it. Uh, a perfect solution in my mind, again, this is my mind, and, maybe some others as well, would be if we could do photovoltaics on top of some sort of structures over some of the parking area, which would do two things for us. It would provide shading for the vehicles parked in the, uh, the hot summers of Atlanta and provide the photovoltaic energy for our building. Sure, you wouldn't have to worry about the snow being down in, in Georgia like we do here in <laughs> most areas of Canada. So if we get any snow or, or freezing rain, they just shut the whole city down. Yeah, I was going to say we have bigger issues. <laughs> uh, I have a question here from uh, Sharon Bodie. He, she joined a bit late, uh, but great question here. Um, what's the construction market like um, in Georgia? Is so an, a historically conservative market is often a stumbling block uh, where she's located. Well, it, it, Atlanta, Georgia. It's like just a boom, was a booming market. I, of course, everything's slowed down a little bit right now. But when we, when we purchased the building and went into the market, uh, it, it's just unbelievable, uh, the construction going on. And the other thing is when we look at leasing, the leasing rates are just through the roof as well. Uh, so it's a real hot market. So it was really challenging for us to, uh, to stay within a reasonable budget to do this, uh, to do this building right right way uh, but I believe we've really really achieved it and uh, and we hope that people can learn something from our experience uh, that will, will be of value to them as we start to share our, our information. One of the things we're doing as well is uh, we've been working with BOMA Building Owners and Managers Association uh, to use this building as a case study for what they call repositioning existing buildings for their members so we're, uh, we're hoping to, uh, to have a, a pretty good case study story available probably sometime early in next year. That's great. It's nice to see that you're working with BOMA as well. I know you're two um, 
uh, big, powerful uh, organizations. So I'm sure there's a lot for you uh, to share. And I'm glad that uh, Ashray is sharing this uh, with the rest of us as well. Um, Oh, Sharon also says that she's uh, looking forward to the BOMA case study. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, another question here, actually from uh, Bruce McCullough, I'm sure a few people are at, wondering, uh, will the slides be available afterwards or, or a case study? Uh, well, the case study will be available for sure. Um, the slides will be available. We're, we're updating a bit of the information as I went through some things. Uh, when the original presentation was done, about four months ago. Uh, some things have been locked in since then, so we want to make sure we have it accurate. So the slides will be updated probably in the next uh, month or probably a month or so, because now uh, all the uh, all the changes that we've had to uh, deal with in terms of uh, the so-called value engineering and, and, and dealing with staying within our, our budget, but still keeping the important pieces of the scope in place have pretty much been done at this point. That's great. So definitely the case study. Um, can we find that on your website? You can find a lot of information on our website. I'm not sure that this presentation is on there, but no. a lot of the information that's presented in here is on our website under uh, the global headquarters. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, I have another question here from David Katz is, what is the building automation system and does it new use new AI and FDD? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you, obviously, ASHRAE is uh, the technical society that's uh, involved with many organizations and companies uh, because of our impact in the built environment. Uh, so one of the things that we did is that uh, we offered opportunities for organizations to donate uh, equipment and systems to the building and also donate money. Uh, we've been actually quite successful on the financial side. We, we have about, uh, we've had organizations donate a total, organizations members donate a total of about 6.4 million to the project uh, in addition to equipment. So the building automation system that's going in is, uh, is supplied by automated logic. Um, it could have been supplied by, by other sort of uh, building automation companies, but the company that gave us the best deal for it and met the requirements for the building was automated logic. But not only do we have a system that's, uh, that's uh, sort of new, new technology, we've also been working with Cisco and uh, we're fundamentally bringing in what Cisco calls the fourth utility. So the IT uh, backbone will be in place and all our, all our uh, building automation will, will, will feed into the backbone, IT backbone, our telephone system will be on the IT backbone, our audio visual equipment will be on the IT backbone. And uh, so that we'll have a, a quite a robust uh, data um, um, transmission backbone and analytical backbone. Uh, we've also, uh, we've been actually looking to two different organizations, and there might be a third one now, looking at fault detection and analytics software that we can also overlay on the building uh, so that we can be analyzing um, the, the operation of the building on an ongoing basis, finding ways to uh, improve its effectiveness from both an indoor environmental quality point of view and from an energy utilization point of view. So we will have fault, detect fault detection and analytics uh, in the building, and this will be demonstrated on our website as to how this is all working. That's perfect. And I also, uh, just for everyone in the Zoom webinar chat, which is you can open up at the bottom of your screen there as well. Uh, I did share, I uh, went quickly to Ashway, Ashway's website and the uh, link to the New World Headquarters Building Renovations Project. Uh, I co uh, copied and pasted the link in there. So if anyone's uh, interested, it's quite um, 
a fantastic site with a lot of uh, pictures and, and details as well. So be sure to, to go there to check everything out. Um, just another question here from uh, Hamid is uh, related to uh, lighting and AI is, did you consider network lighting, so wired slash wireless, DC lighting or POE, which is power over ethernet uh, technologies? Yes, we did. And um, we, uh, so part, part of the problem with the power over ethernet from both a building automation point of view and, and a lighting point of view is that we do need a, a, a much larger number of uh, IT switches to do that. And in our base budget, we didn't we didn't really have the financial capacity uh, to be adding all those switches. So we moved to a, a it's sort of a, a lighting control system that's not POE. Uh, it is uh, all LED. All our lighting will be LED, and we have a lighting control system in place. And if you ask me who it is, I, I would say I don't have it at the top of mind. Um, then uh, Cisco came to the table and, and the option to have uh, POE lighting jumped up and, and by that time it, the lighting fixtures had already been ordered and, and uh, the majority of them were on site. So it, it, uh, it's a fast paced project and sometimes you just can't change midstream. If we could, we would, but uh, in this case we were not able to. Thanks so much, Gerald. I'm just uh, watching the time, so I'm going to wrap up for today. But thank you for joining us for this week's great discussion. Uh, I'm sure that our listeners will agree that this has been a very insightful presentation. It's nice to see a lot of the things that we, we hear about and learn about in conferences being put into practice and see if they're um, you know, try, fail, success measures that you, you that you mapped up there and see how and follow along on your website as well. So thank you very much to yourself and to the team at ASHRAE for making that available to all of us. Um, so thanks again to our presenter, Daryl Boyce, for, uh, president of ASHRAE for joining us. I look forward to everyone joining us next Friday, along with our guest speakers from ThinkWell Shift, who run green schools in Nova Scotia. Uh, they, it's a program that provides energy efficient and environmental education to over 30,000 P to 12 students annually. So our speakers are going to share how their team quickly adapted their delivery model to support parents, teachers, and students during the first weeks of social distancing. So if any of you have any uh, young ones at home, I'm sure this is a presentation you uh, won't want to miss. You'll be able to pick up some tips and tricks and things for to keep your uh, um, loved ones occupied. Uh, so it should be a good one. But until then, I hope everyone enjoys the long weekend. Thanks so much again, Daryl, and uh, enjoy your long weekend. Bye, everyone.